I was glad to hear from Lorraine today. Good to see Lorraine back with us. I heard from Lorraine today that I spoke to a, a woman yesterday that had a fairly drastic family situation and getting that thing we talked about this morning, Lorraine gave a report today, it's taken care of. But, but yesterday, you know, I prayed with her on the phone and said, let's pray about this. I don't know the nature of the problem. So often the older I get, the less I realize I even know what the problems are. They're, they're so complicated and maybe you're going through that. But in the midst of these complicated problems, guess what? Who's in control? Who's sitting on the throne? Who's not the least bit worried or, I said this last week, God never, ever, ever says, oh, that caught me by surprise. He sees so far out into eternity and so far backwards into before there was light, before there was the world. He sees it all, as I think John mentioned today, he sees it all at one time. And nothing surprises him. And if we really believe, dear sister that mentioned in Bible study today, I believe it here, I think it here, I just don't always feel it here. We need to get our belief lined up with what our knowledge is. And say, when God gives us this book of knowledge and wisdom and says, live by this book, it can't be something we quote. I, I was reading a book earlier this week. I can't remember the author of the name of it. Uh, I think it was uh, Richard Land, former head of the uh, Ethics Religious Liberty Foundation C Council. I think it was him. But uh, he had said it's not necessarily for church people. The world, it's a lack of knowledge. They don't have this book. But for church people, it's not a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of faith in the knowledge they have. Oh, I can quote it, and I know it, and I read it. it but as soon as I put it down, it's like I, I, I forget it. I go out into the world, and I see what the news is saying. I see what my neighbors are talking about. And I see what's on TV, and I see all these horrific images. Uh, you, you know, and I get worried, and I get scared, and I get frightened. We don't have a spirit of fear. We have a spirit of power. And so hopefully today, as we talk about this, I started saying in Daniel chapter 2, the word tells us God changes the time. I don't know if some of you saw my post. I know I brought some oranges in today. But I was out in my backyard the other day looking at my orange tree, and I thought in the midst of all this confusion we're seeing as a nation and as a world, the, the world is going through some pretty drastic changes in the way things are done. And a lot of us have that sense, that feel. I, I talk to some people that are not believers, and I even hear them say, things are not right. There's something going on. Th that sense, I think that's God's spirit working on people, telling them your work uh, right. You need to find Jesus. I think that's what's going on. I mentioned that last week. In the midst of all this confusion, what a blessing it is that people are coming to the church asking, what's going on? Science has failed us. The dollar has failed us. Sports has failed us. The movie industry has failed us. The news has failed us. We're looking for something that's solid and concrete and can be established and solid. Folks, that's Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's solid. That's the only thing that is yesterday, today, and tomorrow the same. does not change. And if you're saying, well, my world seems upside down, it's not stable, stand on the Word. Stand on Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. So this verse in Daniel, and so I was looking at my orange tree thinking, with all that's going on, my orange tree is still doing what it's supposed to do. It's yielding oranges. The grass slowed down a little bit of growth, thank goodness. But uh, the grass is still growing. I saw some birds flying over. They were still singing. Our chickens are still laying eggs. We got to start bringing eggs in here. We're getting about, I don't know, six or seven dozen a day, and I can't eat them. I can't eat that many. I'm good about two or three dozen, but I can't get six or seven dozen. We have like 100 chickens. And, and, and my point is the chickens are laying their eggs like they're supposed to. So much of what God says in seed time and harvest, rain and sunshine, winter and summer, God established those seasons and they're continuing. No matter what we do, the plans of men, they will not affect the plans of God. And so I think we need to remind ourselves of that. And we know it here, but we need to actually feel it here. Hey, God, I don't really care what happens, what the happenings are out there. I'm very comfortable in that you're in here, and I can rest in that. And so this Daniel goes on to say, God changes the times and the seasons. Wasn't today a beautiful fall morning? Yeah, it really was. Why, why is it at 95 degrees? Because God said there'll be seed time and harvest, and the winters will change in the spring and the summer. What is it in, in Texas? We have hot, a little bit hot, cool, uh, warm, hot, <laughs> you know, the seasons. But it says, God changes the seasons. Listen to this. He removes kings and he sets kings up. God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So think about that last verse. God gives wisdom to the wise. God, you're the one that raises up kings and set, takes them down. Not the plans of men. God does that. We say it so often, Lord of lords. What's the next phrase? King of kings. God's the one that says, you're the leader of this, you're the leader of that, you're down, you're up. 
God orchestrates that. And yes, we can have our opinions and our views and we can express them, but we don't have to get out of, out of character, out of our Christian walk with our views. Our views have to be our citizenship in heaven first. And I hope here in the next few moments after we finish up with uh, 1 Timothy 2, these first eight verses, I hope you leave here today with joy in your heart, not just in your mind and knowing the words, but say, that's right. That's exactly how I need to behave in 2020 as a Christian first. That's the answer that I need to go with. So I'm going to read these first few verses, and we're going to, uh, eight verses, and we're going to talk about them. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I urge then, first of all, just real quick, look up to chapter 1, verses like 3 and 4, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, I urge you when I went into Macedonia, this is chapter 1, verse 3, when it says, first of all, I want to say, what's he talking about? When he says, I urge you then, first of all, based on what we read, we're not going to read it, we're just going to mention it. Verse 3 of chapter 1, I went into Macedonia to stay there at Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines. Is anyone out there running around with fake news today? Yesterday, Kelly and I said, I'd really like to know an update on what's going on with the election. How do I find out? I was completely lost with, who, who, where would you go to say, what's really going on? Does anyone know? And the answer is nobody knows. But one person does. He's up there. But it was so odd yesterday saying, I'd like to have an update on what's going on with the election. And I said, I don't know on my little magic black box what to do. Where do you get that information from this re the real? And I thought, that's, that's where I was yesterday. That's where I am today. And guess what? I don't care because I know he knows. He knows what's going on. And so it says, don't get caught up in false doctrines any longer, nor devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies that promote controversies. And does any of this sound like what's going on in America today? Endless controversies and myths and news and information, and it's all just a big mishmash. It says, don't get caught up in that. So after that chapter one, Chapter 2 says, based on what we just read, or what, what we, uh, Paul told Timothy, based on what I just told you, with all that going on in the background, so guess what? We're not going through anything new, folks. It's been going on for at least 2,000 years, probably 3,000. You know, uh, trying to think uh, when Abraham came in maybe and told his sons, hey, who, who ate my potato chips? You know, it was Isaac. It was him over there. You know, it was this, probably it was even going on back then with... Who knows what's going on? So it says, based on all that, based on endless genealogies, and that was people back then arguing over, here's my family history, and here's your, and I'm better than you because look who my family is. And that was the argument back then, is my family is better than your family, and therefore I'm somehow better than you, and they'd argue over that. But it says, based on all that endless myths and arguing, first of all, what does that mean? Primary and emphasis. First of all. With all that going on in the world around us, First of all, brothers and sisters in Christ, make your requests, your prayers, your intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. In the midst of all this, we can go to prayer. We have prayer right there in front of us in these four different uh, things, your request or your supplications. By nature of the word supplication or prayers, or I'm sorry, request is, God, I'm in need of something. You are the sustainer, the provider, Jehovah Jireh, you're the provider of everything. And by me coming to you with a supplication, that's a request or I need something. That attitude right there at the very beginning says, God, you are all sufficient and I am totally insufficient. And I need something for, from you. Or, I, and we're going to get the word intercession in a moment. Prayers is general speaking to God. Maybe some of you today when you're driving in, you were just, God, thank you for a beautiful day. Those oranges we had, I don't know if you had them yet or not. I don't think so. They're delicious. There, I had a store-bought orange and one off our tree. There is no question. It's not just because it's my orange. It's, I said it's like eating a glass of orange juice. There is juicy and sweet. Remember when, I don't remember when I was kids, your grandma would cut an orange in half and put uh, sugar on top of it? I don't eat them like that anymore. They're, they're sugary enough for me. But those are, man, it feels like they got sugar on top of them. Look how beautiful those are. Yeah. But God did that. I might have planted the tree and watered it, but guess who brought the increase? God brought the increase. How does that tree work? I have no idea. I put a little seed in the ground or a little thing this big, and now it's that big. God did that, and he promises that. So it says, first of all, let your request. God, I'd like some oranges. He gives me the ability. I can have my own oranges now. So I, I went to God with a request. Ultimately, if you're a believer, you went with him. God, I'm a sinner. I can't stand before you. I need the blood of your son to wash away my sins. 
that's ultimately the first request that we go to God with. God, I need salvation. Salvation comes from the Lord. So we go to him with our request. Our prayers are that general conversation we have with God. Thanks for a beautiful day. God, thank you for your holiness. What do we know of holiness? That word has been with me for probably most of this summer and this fall, saying, God, we are so far. I am so far from your definition of holiness that how could you possibly have your son die for me? What would cause you that holy of a God to, to love somebody like me? It's, it's, it's awesome. I don't even have an English word or I don't think there's a human word to describe how awesome God's holiness is. And then intercession. Intercession is where we pray for one another. I, I said yesterday there was three or four people I spoke to yesterday from our church or members or people in our church, maybe visitors. I don't know exactly their membership status, but I spoke to three people yesterday and every one of them, I've got this concern, I've got this issue, I've got this problem. Okay, I don't know the solution, but I know who does. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. What a blessing that is that we can just go to in intercession right into the God, the creator of everything, the provider of everybody and everyone, the creator of everything that's ever been made. Without him, nothing is made that was made. We can go right in his throne room at any time and say, my brother or sister or this lost person has a need, Father. Uh, some years ago, we had a, uh, I coached my youngest daughter's soccer team, and we had a party after one of the games. There was something going on, and all the kids had their uniform on, and there's like 100 kids there, and we only had like maybe 15 or 20 cupcakes or whatever it was so not every kid could have it was our team and uh, I saw a kid come over with a different colored uniform on I said well this is for I think they were called the rebels I don't know why they named that name but I said this is for the rebels and uh, my daughter said but daddy that's my friend guess who guess who in a red uniform got a cupcake when my daughter said but daddy that's my friend before it was no you're, you're not part of this group but daddy that's my friend you're, not, you're welcome the moment my daughter said that's my friend it changed my I don't want to say my attitude, but my perspective on who that child was. And when we go to our Father in heaven and say, Father, my brother is hurting, my sister is hurting, God will listen to that prayer. That's a mature Christian that says, God, I'm not gimme, gimme, gimme. God, provide for them, help them, help their situation. What did Jesus say on the cross? Not my, or in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. It is finished. Who did he say that for? John 17, which is actually the Lord's Several of you are doing this. He said it for us. John 17 is actually the Lord's prayer where he says, Lord, I pray for those that you have given me. He, he prayed for us. His intercessory prayer was for us. We become, we, we start entering that degree of holiness when we start saying, God, my needs are not important. My brother or sister that's needing and struggling and having whatever the issue of this world is that's weighing on them, Father, comfort them, bless them, provide for them, help them. That's intercession. And do it with thanksgiving. How, how joyful. I, I was reading this this week, and I was thinking of who I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for everyone here. I'm really I'm thankful for the fellow uh, men and the women and the Sunday school teachers, the Iwana leaders, the praise team, those that are at home that might say, well, I can't get out, I can't do this, I can't, but I can sit here and pray. I said, Lord, I am so thankful to be part of the family of God, to look around at each one in this room today and say, you're my brother, you're my sister. You know, I, I love you, you love me, not because necessarily we all agree on everything, but we have one thing in common, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And based on that love I have for Christ, I love my brothers and sisters. We, we all have that opportunity to go to one another and pray for one another, lift one another and tell Lord, Lord, thank you for Gideon. Thank you for Rick. I told Cindy last week, as much as I like all of our instrumentals up here, for some reason the flute and the drums... I have no rhythm, but sometimes I'm watching Rick, and I, I have rhythm for a little bit. Your rhythm's so good, it gives me rhythm. Because I'll see my foot tapping, thinking, oh, I'm doing, I'm doing look, I want to film it. Look, I have rhythm today. I don't have rhythm. Remember when you're a little kid, and the guy comes to your school, and you're going to play musical instruments, and I, I said I wanted the drums? I did this, you know, do this, do that. Do you, have you thought of a different instrument? <laughs> I remember that from like second or third grade. The guy said, drums are not your bag. Go, so, go a different direction. <laughs> And he was trying to sell drums to my parents. He said, I'd rather not have the sale. <laughs> you know, that's hurtful. I still remember it. So we can go to our Lord with thanksgiving. And then it says, now look at verse 2. It says, I urge you, first of all, to go to the Lord with your request, your prayers, intercession, thanksgiving made for everyone. What's the next, what's the next word or two there? Especially for kings, leadership. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 
And folks, here I'm going to I'm going to really get into this pretty quickly and deeply. And if you have questions, be, this would be a perfect Sunday to say, I've got a question. We'll try to answer it as best we can or pray about it. God establishes who's going to lead nations. Yes, we have the right to vote, and I think some of that God does. I don't care who leads the nation, but I want someone to. I want all of us today, either from from what I know, Donald Trump or Joe Biden on January 21st will be the leader of this nation. We should begin. We should have been praying for both of these two men eight months ago. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them godly wisdom. Let them lead this nation as you would go. And I mentioned this a week or two ago about it doesn't matter about the donkey or the elephant, but the lamb, the, the lion of Judah, that's what we're focused on. And I thought about that this week. You know that, that God we serve, our Father, you know he doesn't care if this is a Republican nation or a Democrat nation. You know, he has no care at all about that. He wants us to be a holy nation. Holy nation is what he wants us to be. His people specifically. We're to be holy, like he is holy. The, the idea that is Democrat, Republican, yes, you may have your individual opinions. I get that. And you vote as you think God would have you vote. And that's fine. That's wonderful. But don't get so wrapped up in that you forget what we're supposed to be is holy. We're to be holy. And we're to pray for our kings and for those that have authority over us. So I don't. if you love Donald Trump or hate him, if you love Joe Biden or hate him, that is not the issue at all. The issue is here, church, first of all, you pray for them. You pray that they have godly wisdom. We need, they will be the most, one of those two men, as I understand it, will be the most powerful man in the world January 21st. The President of the United States, that I can say pretty definitively, is the, will be the most powerful person in the world. Do you not, is your concern about are they blue or red? Or is your concern that they're godly? And if you want them godly, start praying. And all of us need prayer to, for to be more godly and more holy. All of us need that, desperately. So it says, first of all, pray for those kings that have authority over you. What's the reason? Why do we want a godly leader? What's the next part of that verse say? So that we may live at peace and quiet lives. Who wants that for America? Who, who wants to go home to your neighborhoods and your communities and your stores and your restaurants and just, just be at peace? Just have peace in our communities, in our grocery stores. You, you know, uh, I don't know if, you, if you've been there, but I've been where I walked into a Kroger's and someone almost attacked me because I didn't have a mask on. Get out of here, sir. You can't come in here. Like, well, you know, it startles you for a second. The, or uh, the, the other way, oh, you're silly because you're wearing a mask. You know, I don't even use those really those lexicons anymore or those words. I just kind of do what you feel right. And if you don't want me in here, that's fine. I'll leave. And I told Ross, we went to a restaurant a few weeks ago and the lady said, you can't come in. And I said, I can't go to that table right there. She said, not without a mask. And I said, how's this? <gasps> <laughs> and I held my breath, and I walked over the table, and I said, I said, am I safe now? And she said, now you're safe. Now we'll serve you. And I said, now we have peace. There's peace in the restaurant. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they have every right to tell you, if you're not wearing a mask, don't come in. That's their private business. They have every right to say that. And if they say that, say, okay, I'll either get a mask on, I usually carry one with me just, just for that reason. Because if I go to a nice restaurant, they just can't come without a mask. I want to have a mask because I'm about to have dinner. But, so, but we, ultimately, we want peace, though, in our communities, don't we? Don't you want to just go home and have peace in your community and the neighbor wave at you and you go to the grocery store or at church? and People are just calm. And I don't sense that in our world today. I sense people are up here. Was it Daniel Fenner a few weeks ago that put on Facebook, I think, and he just did a bunch of gobbledygook? on the keyboard, and he had about five people below him disagree with him. You're wrong. <laughs> and it was, it was no words. It was just literally, I think, just he did this on his computer. said, I think, and five, I think I was the first one. I disagree with you, Daniel. <laughs> Here's what I think. And people are just disagreeable in the world we're in today. It doesn't matter what you say. And, and folks, I'm not trying to make too much light of this, but I'm thinking, stand for the flag, kneel for the flag. Do what you want. I'm, I'm focused on me being more holy. We might have opinions on that stuff. I don't care. That's not my focus. And it, as Christians, it shouldn't be our focus because it says we want to live in peaceful lives and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That should be what we're striving for, godliness and holiness. How does me arguing with someone, if I say, I think I demand you kneel for the flag and it's got this and it's got that, and here's my belief and you're standing and I'm going to be upset. 
Oh, let me tell you about Jesus, though. What, how, what a blessing is. You, you've, lo- you've probably lost them already in witnessing to them. And, and as we look at this, I want to see what God's focus is. And this is really where I want us to reorient our vision and our ideas on what God's vision is. We talk about this word provision. I said earlier provision. That really is forward vision. Provision. In, in Latin, it's provideo. I mentioned this, I think, a week or two ago. It's, it's where we got our word video, what we see. God has forward vision. He says, I'm looking way down here, and you're looking way over here at nonsense. Get my vision. And and these next few verses tells us God's vision. As Christians, what we should be focused on. Yes, if you've been to foreign countries, I've been to a few, and maybe you've been as well, there are some countries it is very difficult to witness and to give testimony about Jesus Christ. They may kill you over it. So part of the reason God says pray for your leadership to be godly and peaceful I want the atmosphere of America to be receptive to the church. I will tell you, and I will say this is not an opinion, this is, I believe, factual. I talked to a gentleman the other day that said, why in Nevada are churches closed but casinos are open? How does that make any sense? And you say, right here in America, I'm telling you folks, if you don't see it, you're not paying attention, America is turning against the church quickly. There was a time in my life you could say, thus saith the Lord, or the Bible says, and people would listen. Now you say the Bible, oh, shut up right there, you're an idiot, I don't believe that, that's a crutch, that's, you're, that's fables and nonsense. In my lifetime, I've seen this book, society has just said, that's stupid. We don't want it here. We, we don't want your input from the Bible. We don't believe it anyway. There is no God. That's happening quickly right in front of our eyes, right here in America. And if you don't see it, you're not engaging society because it's there. Uh, so, so we want to have a culture, an atmosphere. The seed is the word. Is the word perfect? Absolutely. The soil it lands on is us. And you know the parable of the soil where there's some different soils. Some are hard. Some are soft. Some have weeds. Some have rocky ground. But some, the seed gets into it and it springs up. I told Kelly on the way in today, I, I, I loved it on uh, Facebook. I've got a friend that about eight years ago, I was in the prisons with him. He was serving, I think, 28 years sentence. He got out about, I think I showed this to Robert Clough this week, that uh, guy I showed you with the backyard, he's doing the Bible study. And uh, about eight years ago, he was in prison on a 28-year sentence. He got out a year or two ago, and on his Facebook now, it shows a, a yard. He works at a, uh, I think it's a halfway house, and there's about 40 men out there in the dark with a little light on, and they've got their Bibles, and they're singing, and they're praying. And he said, this is my ministry that God gave me, working with men right out of prison in his halfway home. I said, what a blessing that is to see that guy who he was 10 years ago become a believer, he got out of prison, and now what he's doing today in the world, saying, I do two or three Bible studies a, a, not a week with about 30 or 40 men in this halfway house. We have four houses, and each night about 30 or 40 come out. It's their night to do the uh, Bible study, and he's leading it. I said another guy I saw in a newspaper up in Estelle Prison. He was a Mexican mafia guy, came to Christ in prison. He, he's now in the prisons teaching. There was a, a platform, and men were coming across saying, how to be a Christian father. He's teaching that class in prison. He's still a prisoner himself. But he was on a, a photo they had in the newspaper saying, I won't mention his name because he was Mexican Mafia, and I don't know who's watching this. But uh, to see this man, who he was 10, 12, 15 years ago, and who he is today in prisons leading other men to Christ from the mob, from the Mexican Mafia. One person does that, Jesus Christ. There's no, nothing else that changes people like that but Christ. And so that's what this passage says. We want to live in godliness and holiness. Why? Why do we as Christians want to live godly and holy? Because this is good and it pleases our Father in heaven. Do you want to be a child that's pleasing to his father? Or that the father, I don't want to say he's shameful of you, but you're not pleasing to him. Maybe that's a better phrasing. Do you want to be pleasing to God or not pleasing? Well, if you want to be pleasing, be godly and holy. If the Bible says to do something, do it. If the Bible says don't do something, don't do it. Wouldn't that be simple if we just obey those two lines? If you're supposed to do something, do it. If you're not supposed to do something, don't do it. End of sentence. But we're all sinners. Thank the Lord some of us are sinners saved by grace. But it says this is the attitude, this godliness and holiness and praying for our leaders. This is the attitude that is good and pleases God our Savior. In verse 4, does it say God wants America to be Republican or Democrat or green or purple or blue or 
libertarian. It, I, that's my, not mine doesn't say that. It says God wants all men to be saved. Should that be our perspective? God wants all men, all people to be saved. Boys and girls, men and women. I, I, I just really was amazed at Nico today and then these, the kids came up here today thinking, uh, th this, this generation in 20 or 30 years, some of us or most of us may not be here. Who will be? Who's gonna carry this message on that God wants carried on to the world? It's gonna be these guys. And we've got to pour our lives into them and show them what it means to be a Christian in America in 2020 or in Houston, Texas. What, is, what does that look like? It means arguing and bickering and arguing with the neighbors and fighting. And If that's the message we're passing to them, we're missing, we're missing God's vision. That's not God's vision. It is God's vision that all men come to Jesus Christ, verse 4, who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I, I tell you, honestly, other than this book, I really don't know what to believe anymore. There's not a new, there, there is not a single news site, newspaper, information on the Internet that I say, oh, well, they said it, so I know it's true. I just don't know anymore. And guess what? I really don't care. <laughs> it just doesn't bother me that much. I'd like to know. It bothers me a little bit, but I'm not going to get sideways over it. I'm just, I'm just, I've come to a point in the last couple months, I'm just not going to get that upset about it anymore. Because what benefit does it do? Does nothing. Does no benefit. So he wants all men to come to the truth. For there is one God. This is where John was stepping on my sermon this morning in Bible study. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? There's one, God, there's one person in the whole world, Jesus Christ, who's the mediator between a holy God and every human being on the world. There's one way. There's one door and one door only. There's one way and one way only. There's one mediator and one mediator only. So the, the, this nonsense of the world that there's many ways to go to heaven, there's a lot of paths, there's as many, as long as you believe something, as long as you're sincere, that is in direct lie from the devil, from the pits of hell, contradiction to what the Bible tells me. The Bible says there's one. How many is one? You pass. There's one and only one. It's so, it, I say that because it's so simple. But we get so caught up with all this other nonsense of the world and we lose track of what we're supposed to be godly holy sharing the gospel of jesus christ with people there's one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men that's exactly that that wording there that word's only used right here in the bible that word ransom there in that particular uh conjugation of the word but it says not only did he come with a ransom and, and you're reading it correctly he is the ransom it's not someone said, hey, we've got some people over here captive and you've got to give us X amount of dollars. It's he's not the gift, I mean, he's not bringing the, the, the ransom, he is the ransom. And it shows a very clear picture there. He, he gave himself as a ransom. He literally traded his life for our life. And this is, the, this is the, the grace of the justification we talked about in Bible study today. All his justice was traded for our sin. All of our sin, he took in trade for our justice. Getting read a verse today, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And as he said that, I wasn't staring off at the wall, Gideon. I think Philip looked at what I was looking at. I was just thinking about that word, God's justice versus my justice. And I was even thinking this morning how little I understand of God's perspective when he says, me killing my son was just. Me killing my son for you, Dale Inman, was justice. God, what do I know of holiness? Because that is so opposite of just in my mind. That is so far from what I understand is justice. And that's, that's why I think we say amazing grace and we sing that song, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I mean, it makes no sense to my brain. I can accept it on faith. Praise God. Guess how we come to him? The one that comes to God must believe that he is and must come with faith. If you come with intellect, and this is what I was saying earlier, a lot of us in churches today, a lot of us at home that know the Bible, it's not a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of obedience. It's a lack of faith. God, you said do A, but my, my, everything in my body is telling me that B is the right answer. Everything I'm thinking, God, says that you're wrong and I'm right. What are you telling God in that? What's your faith when you say, God, I'm smarter than you? What are you saying? That really, that's what you're saying. God, you said do plan A, and you said don't do these behaviors. 
But in my situation, I'm a little smarter than you, and God, you're not really taking into account everything that I'm dealing with. In my, and so I'm going to do plan B because plan B is right. Th this other idea I come up with is the right plan. Baloney. That is the devil speaking to you and possibly through you. I mentioned this, I think, last week. There is an incredible struggle over the narrative for this world. And not when I say this world, I'm not talking about the ground and the dirt. I'm talking about human beings. And the narrative is, God said, and the competing narrative is, did God really say? Those are the two, com two, competing, those are the two competing narratives of the world. Are we going to go with what God says or what our brains or the world or sin says? And you're going to have to make a decision. But I know it's for me and my family what we're doing. We're going to serve the Lord. And I hope you come to that decision that you say, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I know as me as an individual, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I'm not going to bend, and I'm not going to yield, and I'm not going to give in, and I'm not going to compromise. God said it. I believe it. And, and I, I, I used to say that. Maybe you do, and I get the, the theory. God said it. I believe it, and that settles it. Baloney. God settles it. God said it, and that settles it. Your belief has nothing to do with it being settled. The, the farther you stray from God's word, and, and this I really think, uh, my wife and I have talked, if you've got kids, I'm sure you've had this conversation. When you see your kids going down a road that's a bad road, maybe not an evil road, but a road that you say, that's not from God. It breaks your heart. And I really think we have a God in heaven that does that with his children us. I said do A, and you're doing C. My child, what, what pain you're, you're headed towards. What disaster you're headed towards. Get back on my plan. And we come to God's plan through prayers, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. That's, that's when God speaks to me the most is when I'm speaking to him. He speaks to me all the time. He spoke to me yesterday looking at that orange tree. I'm sitting there looking at an orange tree thinking, God did that. And then I, right there in my backyard, kind of had a little worship time with the Lord as he was telling me, God, Dale, I bring that increase. You be faithful in planting and watering, and I'll bring the increase. Does anyone think God is not able to bring increase? Here's the problem. I've said it before. The problem with the gospel message of Jesus Christ is we're not planting and watering. We're not doing the evangelism part. Talked to someone this week, and they said, oh, I hope, whatever they said, but they said, I hope it, we, America never makes it like these foreign countries where you can't evangelize the lost. And I said, yeah, that's a wonderful right we have in America. How many people have you witnessed to this week? Oh, I haven't witnessed people in years. And I said, respectfully, then what do you care? If you're not going to witness, what do you care if America loses its right to evangelize? You have the right, if you're not exercising that right, what, what do you care about it then? Well, I, I'm shy, I'm, I don't like going out there in public, I don't like talking to people about that. It, then what do you care then? It doesn't affect you if we lose the ability. And I know in, in case you haven't been, there are definitely countries, they say if you witness to someone, they're allowed to ask you the question, why do you believe in Jesus, and you can answer them. But if you go to someone and say, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I'd like to share it with you, you could end up in prison for saying that. Legitimately end up in prison or worse by saying, I'd like to share Jesus with you. You can answer questions, but their law says you cannot proselyte. You cannot share unless someone asks you. And if no one asks you in those countries, how do you witness when people don't ask you? I'll tell you how to do it. We've got brothers and sisters in the world today that put their lives in jeopardy to say, I don't care what the law of man says, I obey the law of God. And the law of God says go into all the world preaching the gospel. So I'm going to preach the gospel even if, it, even if it kills me. And we have brothers and sisters that lay their lives down to preach the gospel. We live in a nation that we can go any time to our neighbor in our streets or in a grocery store. And what's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know my Savior Jesus? Can I share with him? We can do that anytime, anywhere with very little reprisal, but we don't. And folks, if we don't start pushing that back on that and start getting more evangelical, we may very well in our lifetime lose that right here in America. And anybody say, oh, it'll never happen. Don't ever say it'll never happen. Where was Christianity originated from? Where did it start? What area of the world? Middle East. Is Lebanon, Syria, Damascus, all those areas. Guess what areas you cannot even say it today? Those exact same areas. If you say, oh, it would never happen to the cradle of Christianity, it would never get kicked out of the cradle of Christianity. It did. Don't think it will never happen here. It very well may. So it says God wants all people to come to the saving grace. And I want to be clear on this because this I want to be very clear. Hopefully there's no universalist in here. If you're a universalist, please get with me after church today. Uh, 
Because they say, well, right here it says God wants all men to save, so therefore if it's God's will, then everyone will be saved. That is not what this is saying. It says God's emotional desire, not his willpower that everyone's saved. He desires everyone to be saved. I think some of your translation might say that. It's the, it, that God desires that everyone comes to uh, saving grace. He desires it. He doesn't make it happen. But he wants everyone to come uh, to saving grace through Jesus Christ, his son. And then it says, uh, this man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, closing up verse 6, the testimony in its proper time. And basically, I, what that's saying is Jesus came at the perfect time. You, you know what it says back here to pray for kings? Who is king? Does anyone know? I'll just say it's Nero. What do we know about Nero and Christians? He was killing them. He was saying, oh, there's Christians over there. Go track them down and kill them. Nero was one of the people that would take Christians, wrap them in uh, animal skins, dip them in olive oil, and hang them from guards at night for candles and light them on fire while they were still alive. That's, that's some of the stuff Nero did to Christians. And could you imagine receiving this letter from Paul that says, oh, pray for Nero. That's what he's saying here. Nero was king at this time. Pray for him. So again, I go back to, I don't care who on January 21st is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm going to start praying for both those men today, and I'm going to pray for them for the next four or five years, or, or eight years, or whatever, as long as their president is. I don't know. But I'm going to pray for our leaders and be, and be focused and sincere about that because, as we saw in verse 3, because this pleases God. And it has nothing to do with your emotions or what you feel about those people. That's not what God's concerned about. God's concerned about his children being obedient. And he tells us to pray for kings. Uh, and pray for those that tweet crazy stuff. <laughs> and for, the, and for and Paul says, and I would not only say Paul writing to Timothy, I want, I took this, this is Paul writing this, but I took this first person, I would hope you would too, verse 7. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald or a messenger or a deliverer of the gospel message and apostle. We weren't necessarily by the technical term apostle, says someone that saw Jesus Christ in the flesh, face to face. We wouldn't necessarily fall in that category as that definition that we as evangelical Baptists would say apostle means you saw Jesus face to face in the flesh. Uh, so we may not go with that title, but we certainly go with God saved you for a purpose, right? Is that purpose for you to go home and sing warm, fuzzy songs on Sundays or come to worship? Or is it so you could share that story with somebody else? I want you all to have the messages, as we all should, all Christians should at home as well. For this purpose, I was appointed a messenger of the gospel. You've been appointed. Are you living up to that walk that God has called you to? Are you sharing the gospel message with people? You know, if 90%, if 70%, 100% of America, if we were all believers in Jesus Christ... Do you think the nonsense we see in the news would be happening? I'm going to tell you, no, we would have a very different America if we were all believers. So should we spend our time and energies, the majority of our time and energies, I want to stress, if you, if you're, if you're, if you vote and you stay aware, I hope, I, that's great, wonderful. We should have a, 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 an idea of what's going on in the culture of the day. But if you spend this much time there and this much time in the Bible, you've got your, your times backwards. Focus this much over here and this much over here. Have more time praying for people. Because if we evangelized America, I know this may shock you. You know, the, I think the third or fourth most lost nation in the world, you're sitting in it right now. The North American Mission Board was formed, NAMB, North American Mission Board, was formed. It says North America is one of the most lost nations in the world by population. Part of that is, just for you know, uh, full disclosure, we have so many people here. You have a nation with 20 million people, they will have less people lost as a nation with 300 or 350 or whatever we have now. There will be less people. But as far as numbers of people, individual people, America is one of the top nations of the world that doesn't know Christ. So what would we expect of this nation? We'd expect confusion and no peace and all that stuff. And if you say, well, I don't want that, how do I fix it? You were appointed a messenger. You were appointed a messenger to bring the gospel to this nation. You were planted here for a reason. I, I've often heard... Bloom where God planted you. He planted you in Houston, Texas, or in Katy, or in Cyprus, or in this general area. This is where you live right now. While you're here, bloom. 
I saw, I saw early this week, I put on Facebook, and I've said this before, don't live your life so people know who you are. Live your life so people know who Jesus is. Be focused on that. Have a purpose. For this purpose, you were appointed a messenger to tell people about there's one mediator and one God, the man Christ Jesus. In verse 7, and for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. And I feel like saying the same thing. I'm telling you the truth. If you want to know what the truth is, right here Paul says, and I thought about that, why does Paul in the middle of this have to say, I'm telling you the truth? I think a part of it was, guys, I just told you pray for Nero. And some of you are probably, well, pray for that guy? What, are you crazy? And he says, I'm telling you the truth. This isn't my words. This isn't Paul's words. This is Really, ultimately, this is the words of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, listen, people, I'm telling you the truth. You were appointed for a purpose. And for a, for a purpose... Um, a herald messenger, and I'm telling you the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. Really, the Gentiles, if you're a believer, I'm not going to go too far down this road, you've been grafted in to the tree of Abraham. Gentiles are grafted in, you're not Jewish maybe by blood, but God's going to deal with you as a holy nation like the Jews because you were grafted in. Gentiles are basically today those that don't have Christ. Anyone that you know that doesn't have Christ, you are appointed a messenger to go to that person. And, if you, and some people, I've, I've heard this especially with families, I've got a cousin-in-law or sister-in-law or brother-in-law or some family member that says, when I speak to them about the Lord, all it does is start an argument. I can't speak to them. Verse 1, I urge you, first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession. God, if not me, if you can't use my mouth to work with this person about leading them to Christ, Father, send somebody else. And if you pray that for that loved one of you, you know, there may be someone praying that you're the person that goes to their neighbor, that there is their cousin or uncle or sister that you witness to them. God will use different servants for different purposes. And you might be the servant that says, if you would open your mouth and evangelize your neighbor or your community or your grocer or your friend, there's someone praying for that person. You could be an answer to their prayer by simply telling them. How will they come to faith without hearing? How will they hear unless someone tells them? No one's going to wake up one day that's never heard about Jesus and just put this story together and say, oh, there is a God. Nature tells them that. We call that general revelation, specific revelation, one uh, mediator, God and man, the man Christ Jesus. No brain is going to make up the name Jesus Christ. They're going to have to hear that from somebody, that that God has a son. He sent his son into the world to die for our sins. He died on the cross. He gave himself a ransom for us. He traded his justice and perfectness for our sinfulness. And he gave us all his justice and took all our sin. And you can be right with God by believing Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you can have right standing with God. Amen. That's basically the message. That's not basically, that is the message. Something that quick, 30 seconds. Do you believe? You, know, you have no idea that someone might have been praying for this person for days, weeks, months, years. Lord, send somebody to them to tell them about Jesus. You might be that person. You were appointed a role in God's kingdom. Are you doing your role? Am I doing my role? I, I look, God, am I doing what you would have me do? And if I'm not, re- reorient. Get me focused back on your plan for my life. So it says, I'm telling you the truth. I am not lying. Paul was appointed a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. And ultimately here at verse 8, I think Paul, through this passage that you've heard today and that I've said, uh, Paul comes to the conclusion where God is, and this should, be, this should exactly be our perspective. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. How do we get to verse 8? How do we get all people, men and women, boys and girls, to hold up hands, praising God, with no arguing, no disputing between them? The only way that's going to happen on this earth is that they know Jesus Christ. There will be no other method that brings people together. And I, and I think in God's grace, I really have, I'm coming to the conclusion more and more as I pray and think about this. They said for years, one of the universal things in America was the flag. And I'm not, folks, I'm not taking this side or that side. I'm really trying to be on God's side. I really, truly, from my heart, am saying we need to be on God's side. And, and whether you stand or sit or feel this or that, the flag no longer unites us as a nation. The Constitution no longer unites us as a nation. I don't know that anything unites us as a nation. But I know one thing that will unite us as a nation, a mediator. 
Jesus Christ. So what should our focus be? What is God's focus? I think if, if there was a flag in here, I don't see one. Maybe there's one somewhere. I got one on my lapel pin here. Uh, but but if, if, if someone's kneeling for a flag, I would say, you're worthless, an idiot, and go back, and if you don't like America, leave it. Oh, let me tell you about Jesus, though. How far does that message go? Don't worry about it. God's in control. I want, if, our, if we really come to the position of verse 8, that we can say as individuals in our hearts, God, I want all men to come to saving grace through your son, Jesus Christ. That's what I want. Give me that vision. So much of this stuff, you just, it just feels like the weights just drop off. You don't, you don't wake up nervous and worried and fearful and concerned about this stuff. Yeah, it's a concern. I'm, I'm going to plan and I'm thinking. I lo look at that and I pay attention. But on the big scheme of things, 20,000 years from today when we're in heaven, is anyone going to say, oh, yeah, but I remember back in, I remember back in so-and-so when that guy stood for the flag or he knelt or he did this or he did that and I, I won't forgive him. You think you're going to care about that in heaven? Then why care about it here? You can have your opinions. Big deal. Have your opinion. But our attitude needs to be, I want men everywhere to lift their holy hands and praising God. That needs to be what our, our goal is, is we're here on this earth. And let the other stuff, let the other stuff go. Is that my phone? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. No, don't worry about it. I don't, I don't really care. It might be the biggest blessing of my life. Tell me three years ago, do you have a phone? Oh, I lost my phone. When? Three years ago. I never replaced it. <laughs> you remember how, how easy life was? I know you young folks don't. You remember as an adult how easy it was back when before phones? You had freedom. Yeah. Now you're doing, I see a bunch of, yeah. You had freedom. I know my, my grandfather, he, he didn't even like phones in the house. He said, no, you need to talk to someone, you go over to their house and talk to them. If it's not important for them to come over and say something, then I don't want to hear from them. I don't want to answer the phone. Now you're doing something, you're busy, you're talking to somebody, oh, hold it, the phone. You know. But anyway, um, I, I want us to really, as a church, we move forward in what I'm going to call the uh, gospel 20s, not the roaring 20s, but the gospel 20s. I would love for us, God willing, he hasn't come back yet, and we're still here, but in 2030, to maybe look back and say, you know, when we kicked off that year 2021, going into that Thanksgiving, Christmas season of 2020, folks, and I mean this, and I, I've been earnestly praying for the last couple weeks, I really think Autumn Creek's best days are still ahead. I really, really believe that. When I walked around this building this week and I was looking at the men and women that have come before and uh, Lynn and Lloyd donating baptismal and other people donating this and drum kits been donated and monies that have come in and walls have been built and air conditioning has been replaced and all the work and the carpet. And I, I was here the other day just looking saying, someone actually rolled this carpet. There was someone kneeling there putting this carpet down. I don't even know who they were. God provided all that stuff, all this building, all this, the talent we have in our praise team. You don't find this kind of talent just walking down the road. This is, God's created this group, I believe, these voices, and these musicians. And he's done it for our benefit so that we can be encouraged and picked up and lifted up and go out and find that, God, I, I see I'm getting the glimpse of your vision, and your vision is you want all people to come to Jesus Christ, don't you? God, let me have that vision too. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this message today, and Father, I hope that your Holy Spirit imparts it to your servants here at Autumn Creek and at home watching and visitors as well, that we get your vision for this nation. For this nation that you've planted us in, you've had us born at this time, at this season, for such a purpose as to lead people in our communities today to Jesus Christ and to share that with them the one mediator, the man Christ Jesus, is the only way to come to a holy God. Father, help us to be impactful and purposeful in our lives and, and slow down the things of the world and the activities of the world and just realize how, how insignificant they are compared to that one man or woman comes to Jesus Christ and accepts him as their savior. Help us that to be our driving force in our words and our actions and uh, all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.